Tezuka Osamu is known as the godfather of manga thanks to his contributions to the manga and anime industry in Japan. But did you know that many people, such as manga authors and animators, blame Tezuka for making their lives difficult? I was surprised too, since all I've ever heard about the late author were of his accomplishments. So I did some research to find out why many people in the industry share the same sentiments. Apparently, when Tezuka's series, Tetsuwa no Atomu, or as it's called in the West, Astro Boy, was given an anime adaptation, the author and his production company, Mushi Production, did it for 500,000 yen an episode, which is equivalent to 3,000 or 4,000 dollars. You wouldn't be able to do much with such a low budget. In fact, Tezuka tried to make up for any loss by cutting production costs and granting copyrights to toys and other items. If he was still in the red, then he'd invest his personal fortune made from his manga career. This low bid basically set the precedent for the anime industry moving forward. If Tezuka, the godfather of manga, was accepting work for barely any money, then no other production company would be able to negotiate anything higher than he would and would have no choice but to follow suit. Toshio Okada, a co-founder and former president of Gainax, agrees that Tezuka is responsible for setting the precedent, but other production companies are just as guilty. On his YouTube channel, Okada explained what went down during the creation of Astro Boy's anime. While you may know Tezuka as the godfather of manga, he also delved into the anime industry, where he made some very questionable choices. The first anime film he was credited on was Sayuki, which is based on the Journey of the West story. The feature-length animated film was produced by Toei Doga, which is now known as Toei Animation today. Thing is though, he was hardly at the studio to actually help any part of the production. While he was credited as the director, most likely as a way to promote the film with his status, he wasn't deeply involved. It was also the first animated film to get a release in the United States in the 60s. It was a successful film in Japan, but not so much in the United States however. Nonetheless, this experience got the famous author interested in animation. He created an anime production company a few years later called Mushi Production, which is composed of animators he's worked on with previously at Toei Doga. Their first animated film was released in 1962, titled Story of a Certain Street Corner. Tezuka employed a lot of budget-saving techniques, such as repeated and reverse animation cycles. While production was rough, the film managed to attract many of Japan's talented artists to the studio. While everyone was singing praises for Mushi Productions, there were two people who weren't too pleased, Hayao Miyazaki and Isao Takahata, who were both employed by Toei Doga at the time. Toei Doga was actually thinking about creating anime just for television. In addition to that, the company was going through a labor strike. Both Miyazaki and Takahata joined Toei Doga with the intention of creating good anime while at the same time protecting workers' rights. Now there was discussion between Toei Doga and television stations about creating a 30 minute anime series that would be broadcast weekly. An episode would cost 3 or 5 million yen an episode to create, or roughly between $30,000 to $50,000 an episode. And on top of that, making anime weekly seemed impossible. As an alternative though, Toei Doga wanted to create a 30 minute anime that would air every 3 months on network television, basically once every season. That was the plan until Tezuka, the newcomer that he is, showed up and said, let me do Astro Boy and we'll run it every week. Fuji TV, of course, was swayed in favor of the manga artist's low bid. This really upset Miyazaki and Takahata, who criticized Tezuka's naive idea of creating a weekly anime while cutting costs, all because the manga artist wanted to bring to life one of his own series. The two knew what he'd have to give up in order to make a weekly deadline work with so little money. The two would say things like, that's not animation anymore, it's just crude storytelling with pictures. Thanks to the low cost of 500,000 yen an episode that Tezuka started with Japan's first anime, Astro Boy, the toxic practice of low production cost of every anime since then was born. Hayao Miyazaki said in a memorial to Tezuka after the godfather of manga passed away. Now here's the thing though, while Toei Doga was against Tezuka's low bid, they were also accepting work for low pay as well. And soon after, other studios did the same thing. According to Okada, every animation studio in Japan at the time were guilty of doing the same thing. The production of anime in Japan has changed a lot since then. While Mushi Productions and Toei Doga were rivals, there's so much anime in the pipeline now that studios have no choice but to commission each other. For example, during the production of Dragon Ball Z, Toei Animation did not have enough in-house animators at the time to meet weekly deadlines. So, in order to make the broadcast work, they outsourced other studios to help with the animation, such as Studio Junio and Segasha. 
It's also common to see animation studios commission animators from outside of Japan. In 2021, Artist Unknown, a blog dedicated to animation, published an interview with Vincent Shonsa. He's responsible for many popular key animations in recent years. In fact, he was the action animation director for episode 204 of Boruto. In the interview, he talked about the difference between France and Japan's anime industry and called Japan's animator wage pocket change. The vast majority of my work and around 95% of my salary are from French productions. I can live comfortably from that. I consider my work on Japanese productions as a hobby. What I earn from it can be called pocket change. As an example, the pay for three episodes of Boruto is still less than one month's salary from France. According to the French animator, the average salary in France is twice the minimum wage in the country, whereas in Japan, the average salary of animators is less than those working minimum wage. So how much do animators in Japan make these days? Animator Ayana Nakamura, who has worked on anime such as Vinland Saga and Boruto, stated that she makes about $40 a cut. Cuts are like a shot in filmmaking, and each one contains a certain duration of action. But unlike filming, you actually have to draw each frame. Keep in mind, a cut can take half a day or even several days to complete, depending on how much action and movement is in a scene. Nakamura only makes about $500 to $600 a month. Animation studios have their own fixed budget. The reason why they can't get paid any more than they do is because advertisement companies take most of the budget. In fact, all the profit that an anime makes goes straight to the companies on the anime production committee. These committees are made up of different companies like ad agencies or music labels that finance the budget of an anime. Now let's talk about the manga industry. As you may know, there are many magazines that run weekly, Shonen Jump being a popular example. Manga authors who work on weekly serializations often have harsh deadlines. Having to churn out 10 to 20 pages of manga weekly, redoing their work if required, attending meetings with their editors, and the list goes on. If their series gets picked up as an anime, then they become even busier. The weekly serialization format all started with Tezuka supposedly. The godfather of manga was illustrating an amazing amount of pages every week sometimes working on three series at once, producing new stories in various genres without losing any creativity. This somehow became the expectations of other manga artists that magazines put forth. His creative genius was unparalleled, but at the same time, set forth a dark path for newcomers. The authors behind a lot of your favorite stories often suffer health issues. Masashi Kishimoto, the author of Naruto, suffered health complications at the beginning of the series serialization. He often had fevers, and couldn't keep any food in. His doctor told him that he's experiencing death in his cells and was told to get some rest immediately. <laughs> According to former manga artist Junpei Kuwayama, debut manga artists make $50 to $70 a page, sometimes even $100 a page. So if a typical manga chapter contains 20 pages, then manga authors can make anywhere from $1,000 to $2,000 a week. But in order to keep up with serialization, manga artists would typically hire an assistant, which costs about $1,500 a month. In addition to that, manga artists would also rent out studios for workspace. As far as book sales go, manga authors only get about 10% of royalties from book sales, despite being the creator. Now, why does exploitation continue to persist in the anime and manga industry? According to Article 1 of the Labor Standard Act, working conditions shall be those which should meet the needs of workers who live lives worthy of human beings. But from what I gathered, the system that's been in place for decades now is hard to change. In addition to that, it looks like everyone's circumstances are treated as a case-by-case -case basis. It would be better if the whole industry changed. To quote manga creator Shuho Sato, it might be better if the manga industry fails so that it could possibly be rebuilt. And that's all for today's video. If you enjoyed my content, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Thank you.